Formerly and during Gerald, I was the chief weathercaster at KXAN Television. The day of the largest, worst, most devastating tornado I ever personally uh, worked in my career. I mean, we all got in this business because we wanted to protect people and save lives and you know, put out a good forecast. And um, 25 years ago, I had what they called the career-defining moment. No doubt about it. Uh, Gerald Tornado is my number one event that I have. And again, from the forecast standpoint, I'm not necessarily impressed by the job I did that day from the forecast in advance. But at the same time, I think we, not Troy, because it's a team effort. When you look at the warning effort, it's a team effort. It's National Weather Service driving this effort and it's the local media. I think we did a real good job. It's the number one event in my book. I don't remember much about the day before because we were so unconcerned. It seemed so routine, you know, nearing Memorial Day. So you always got to look out for any front, you know, that's in the state. But, you know, the upper level support was so unimpressive. It just seemed like no big deal. And so I woke up May 27th like, you know, any other day. When I looked at things at the house before I left, I, I didn't think it was uh, anything still, you know, very concerning. I'm not sure that going into that event, uh, looking at the Monday before into that Tuesday, that we were all that excited. I, I, that forecast was not uh, necessarily a very typical severe weather uh, type of forecast. Now, was there a cold front, a uh, dry line out west that was progressing eastward? Yes. But the upper level wind pattern was not all that, uh, was not all that favorable that day. And uh, then when I got into the television station, um, that's when I started seeing, you know, the tornadoes begin to fire uh, up gotcha. in the Waco area. Gerald was not the first tornado of the day. Mm -hmm. We'd had a whole series of tornadoes, all from the same supercell. And there were two supercells going side by side for a while. And there were one, there was one out east, you know, well east of Interstate 35 over, I think around Limestone County. And it was tornadic but never really did any damage to report much of. But we had one east of us and one west of us, and they both were moving south. It seemed to be southeastward, but really southward. And we were very fortunate not to have gotten hit at the TV station right there on the interstate at Bruceville Eddy, Texas. Uh, we were very fortunate that storm actually moved south-southwest and hit Moody and then went across Lake Belton. My friend Lon Curtis who is pretty well known in Texas. Lon was a volunteer uh, fire captain for the uh, Belton Fire Department. He was on the first storm of the day up by, um, well, it was really close to where I lived in Hewitt, Texas. And he called me and said, you know, this storm's getting going now. The cap's broken and this thing's going up. It was like 1.47 in the afternoon and the first tornado warrant came out. And Juan was there, and he reported it to Fort Worth, and, and it was around Spring Valley between Hewitt and Marina, and it was a beautiful tornado, but it was out in open country, didn't do any damage. He got a great picture of it, got some great photos. And then it kept, it dissipated. He kept moving southward with the cell, and I was at the station starting to do live coverage. And the next tornado dropped around Moody, around Moody, Texas. Um, and that did F3 damage. But we had a camera on top of the TV station, and we were able to zoom in on that storm when it was hitting in Moody. And we had tremendous tornado video of this tornado moving and hitting and things blowing up in the air. And this is early. This is 1997, 25 years ago. We didn't have chasers out there with video cameras. Once you show a tornado on television, then the viewer... And the listeners understand this is real. It puts a whole other element of this isn't just a radar indicated tornado. This is on the ground and it is doing damage. We just didn't have wall to wall coverage very much in any market. You know, you come on, you go off kind of thing, maybe do a crawl for a tornado warning. But we were live. We were live nonstop on the air. And we had these big, huge doors in the studio you could pull backwards you could open and we opened those doors and rolled at a studio television camera and zoomed it in on that tornado hitting and it looked like i was next to the tornado they superimposed me on it at the chroma key wall and it looked like i was standing there with it 
it got people's attention. So that tornado moved on south and hit uh, Lake Belton, hit the Morgan's Point Marina. It lifted the marina up in the air and carried it with 105 boats and dropped it in the middle of that arm of Lake Belton, Texas. That we began to get uh, some thunderstorms pop up up around the Waco area. They were very isolated initially, but they appeared to be rooted, if you will, in the cold front itself or the lift associated with the cold front. But that quickly brought about, if I recall correctly, the biggest surprise of the day, and that was those storms didn't move east and northeastward. They were they seemed to be progressing southwestward. We went on the air. Uh, a little after two o'clock, and, and I'm still sitting there going, this stuff, is it going to get into Williamson County? And it just continued to come. And of course, uh, National Weather Service Fort Worth had issued tornado warnings for Bell County, and, and then National Weather Service Austin San Antonio followed. Uh, I have to say the weather pattern made this easy for us, is that because this swarm of tornadoes had formed up in in and around the Waco area, along this developing line of supercells on, on the coal front, it became clear there were, the environment was right for tornadic activity, and it was moving to the south and southwest, and it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure out, that's headed down toward Williamson County. And we first went on the air at straight up 3 p.m. to talk about the possibility of tornadoes. And this was 30 minutes before the first tornado warning for Williamson County. But the day gets much more tragic. Same supercell moving south, south-southwest, moves on south of Stillhouse Hollow. It gets down to around Prairie Dale, Salado, Prairie Dale, and drops those little, that little rope tornado. Again, Lon Curtis is there taking photographs of these things. And as it shifted southward, it spun into a multi-vortex wedge tornado, you know, ended up being ranked in F5. And then it, and it moved into the, you know, the really the west side of, of Gerald. Uh, one of the most uh, well-known pieces of tornado video is the storm at F5 strength shot by uh, Mike Price, one of our photographers uh, from I-35. Um, and of course, here's the problem. Uh, he was in a, a you know an SUV, but not a live truck, and so I didn't see that video as he was shooting it. They were describing the tornado. I had no idea um, what he was looking at until the video actually did make it back into the station, and they put it on the air for me, you know, forty-five minutes later or an hour later. And I literally could not believe my eyes. And it moved through those neighborhoods, and it you know it took the the asphalt off the roads took the houses down completely to their slabs. You know, it, it took everything out and it's ground everything up. I was surprised how quickly we heard um, a big number of fatalities. It was shocking and it was disturbing and it was um, really, really saddening um, on so many levels. Um, it was just, it was, it was surreal. Still to this day, still haunts me to some degree as we had just gotten into the five o'clock news. So we're on the air. We're talking about what initial reports that we're getting out of, uh, getting out of Gerald and our friends at the Texas division of emergency management, they released something that mentioned that there were a number of deaths in Gerald. And I, if I'm not mistaken, I think they mentioned, you know, maybe 15 deaths or whatever, and I'm just shocked because in a way I'm sitting there in my brain going, okay, we were on the air with this. We were constantly covering this. The National Weather Service Austin San Antonio had a tornado warning out on this. The wording was strong enough. We knew what we'd been dealing with up the road. And so when I heard of the 15 or approximately 15 deaths, I think I wondered on the air live, how in God's name can something like this happen when we've had warning out when we're all three TV stations are covering it. What is going on here? Thing I remember that next morning being on that helicopter was looking down and a light bulb went off in my head. I, I told myself, I don't know this, but this was an EF four or five tornado. Just looking at the damage there were from the air, even at four, three or 4,000 feet, you could see roadways that were gone. And I'm sitting there going, you don't, 
see this, and that's when the light bulb came off in my head, and I said, this tornado, no matter probably where you went, unless you could get below ground, was not survivable. The one tornado that we didn't get footage of, which was kind of hard to reach, was that one on the other side of Lake Travis, of course, over in Alice Valley. Uh, we did end up getting some really great viewer footage of that thing, which really started as a water spout before it turned into that um, EF4, mm -hmm. to this day, the strongest tornado that's ever touched down in Travis County. I mean, so many stories come out of that day. It mm -hmm. just is a day that will live on in Central Texas weather history uh, forever, I think. But there was so much other stuff involved, too, because it wasn't just the tornadoes, which were the, the worst part of this thing. Mm -hmm. These were terrible, severe thunderstorms, uh, yeah. four-inch diameter hail, I, as I recall in some places. The flooding was so torrential, you know, flash flooding at the same time. Yeah, that's, that was the main impact for the city of Austin. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously the most deadly part of the storm that particular day was the tornado threat. Uh, out of the Albertson store out in Cedar Park on that tornado. And that was another interesting event that was about that far from causing death uh, there. If it had not been for the store manager at the Albertson store uh, in this separate tornado event, um, I'm afraid there would have been death. Moments before that store manager got people in a refrigerator at that Albertson store, and no, no doubt in my mind, based on some of the stories and what I was able to see, um, saved lives that day. To this day, people will stop me and say, man, I've been watching you since the day of the Gerald tornado. I'll never forget mm -hmm. you know, your warnings that day and, and you all, what you all did on the air, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that makes you feel good. Um, I met a lady one day at an, an event and she said, um, I want to tell you something. My, um, aunt, um, and her daughter survived the Gerald tornado because you told them, uh, where they should go in their house and they did, but, um, her husband, uh, did not. And I'm like, oh my gosh, were they the, were they the family that, the the daughter got into the bathtub and her mom got on top mm -hmm. of her and her father and and her husband on top of her and the the tornado wiped the house away like it mm -hmm. did all of them um but they survived being blown away in the bathtub the husband of, of course as you know was carried away by the tornado and, and killed she goes she goes yes that was then and at the same time i think it's important we remember those 27 lives in gerald i um, I, I go by Gerald every once in a while and go by the, um, go by the memorial. Well, s surprises, uh, from that day are never to assume that just because the charts that morning don't look conducive to bad weather or to something terrible that something terrible can't, can't still happen if some of the parameters aren't in place nothing um was more of a lesson in that than gerald tornado day for me other nature is pretty good about um if you maybe maybe you don't have the best upper level winds in the world but if you have tape levels of, of, of six to 8,000 joules per kilogram in place, and you have dew points in the, in the, low, in the middle and upper 70s, so you have a good supply of energy, and, and you have this tremendous, almost a biblical sort of instability. I think it taught me a lesson that Mother Nature is pretty good about being able to compensate to some degree for weaknesses in some areas and still take advantage of the atmospheric situation we have. I, I think I learned that more than anything else. The lesson learned for me that day was mm -hmm. don't assume anything based on what hasn't happened yet. Keep an eye on everything when there are any parameters in place that could interact in a way in which other things follow in somewhat of a chain reaction.